Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back to read part two of The Smoky God, A Voyage to the Inner World. And I'm super excited about this, but I have something else that I'm excited about and I have to share it with you all. My daughter and her husband just found out today that they are having a baby girl. So yay, I'm going to be a Mina. Yes, not grandma. No, <laughs> Mina. Um, it will be my first grandchild though, so I'm super excited about that. But anyway, another thing that I want to point out before I start my reading is that I do have in the thumbnail in parentheses with commentary. And I put that there just in case. I don't know if I will actually add any commentary to this today because there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of things that I'm really going to have other thoughts on. But I'm going to try to just read straight through as much as I possibly can because I know that some of you would probably prefer that while others would prefer my commentary. So I'm going to try to keep it in the middle, but today it, my commentary will probably be pretty scarce. So if you missed the first part of the Smoky God, you can, I actually started a playlist for the Smoky God. So you can go right there and it will say part one, part two. And then as I continue, it will go down through all of the parts and you can listen to the first section before you listen to this one, if you so choose. But anyway, let's get started. Today's reading is part two, Olaf Jansen's story. And this book is by Willis George Emerson. And I will leave a link to it in the description box. My name is Olaf Jansen. I am a Norwegian. Although I was born in the little seafaring Russian town of Uleaborg on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Bothnia, the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. My parents were on a fishing cruise in the Gulf of Bothnia and put into this Russian town of Uleaborg at the time of my birth, being the 27th day of October, 1811. My father, Jens Jansen, was born at Rodwig on the Scandinavian coast, near the Lofoden Islands, but after marrying made his home at Stockholm because my mother's people resided in that city. When seven years old, I began going with my father on his fishing trips along the Scandinavian coast. Early in life, I displayed an aptitude for books, and at the age of nine years, was placed in a private school in Stockholm, remaining there until I was 14. After this, I made regular trips with my father on all his fishing voyages. My father was a man fully six feet three in height and weighed over 15 stone, a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort and capable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman in tender little ways, yet his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted of no defeat. I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen and which resulted in the strange story that shall be given to the world, but not until I have finished my earthly pilgrimage. I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am living, for fear of further humiliation, confinement, and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me, for no other reason than that I told the truth about the marvelous discoveries made by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. After four years and eight months absence, I reached Stockholm, only to find my mother had died the previous year and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people. But it was at once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and of my father's terrible death. Finally, one day I told the story in detail to my uncle, Gustav Osterlund, a man of considerable property, and urged him to fit out an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. At first I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested and invited me to go before certain officials and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. Imagine my disappointment and horror when upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and without warning, I found myself arrested and hurried away to dismal and fearful confinement in a madhouse, where I remained for 28 years, long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. 
So I'm just going to add in here that this is something that we have been hypothesizing here on both my channel and in lots of other channels. People were put in these asylums, in these madhouses, because they were exposing people to truths that the powers that be did not want them to know. So I'm going to continue. I never ceased to assert my sanity and to protest against the injustice of my confinement. Finally, on the 17th of October, 1862, I was released. My uncle was dead and the friends of my youth were now strangers. Indeed, a man over 50 years old, whose only known record is that of a madman, has no friends. I was at a loss to know what to do for a living, but instinctively turned toward the harbor, where fishing boats in great numbers were anchored, and within a week, I had shipped with a fisherman by the name of Yan Hansen, who was starting on a long fishing cruise to the Lofoden Islands. Here my earlier years of training proved of the very greatest advantage, especially in enabling me to make myself useful. This was but the beginning of other trips, and by frugal economy I was, in a few years, able to own a fishing break of my own. For 27 years thereafter, I followed the sea as a fisherman, five years working for others, and the last 22 for myself. During all these years, I was a most diligent student of books, as well as a hard worker at my business, but I took great care not to mention to anyone the story concerning the discoveries made by my father and myself. Even at this late day, I would be fearful of having anyone see or know the things I am writing, and the records and maps I have in my keeping. When my days on earth are finished, I shall leave maps and records that will enlighten and, I hope, benefit mankind. The memory of my long confinement with maniacs and all the horrible anguish and sufferings are too vivid to warrant my taking further chances. In 1889, I sold out my fishing boats and found I had accumulated a fortune quite sufficient to keep me the remainder of my life. I then came to America. For a dozen years, my home was in Illinois, near Batavia where I gathered most of the books in my present library, though I brought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Later, I came to Los Angeles, arriving here March 4th, 1901, the date I well remember as it was President McKinley's second inauguration day. I bought this humble home and determined here in the privacy of my own abode, sheltered by my own vine and fig tree, and with my books about me, to make maps and drawings of the new lands we had discovered, and also to write the story in detail from the time my father and I left Stockholm until the tragic event that parted us in the Antarctic Ocean. I well remember that we left Stockholm in our fishing sloop on the 3rd day of April, 1829, and sailed to the southward, leaving Gothland Island to the left and Oland Island to the right. A few days later, we succeeded in doubling Sandhammer Point, and made our way through the sound which separates Denmark from the Scandinavian coast. In due time, we put in at the town of Christiansand, where we rested two days and then started around the Scandinavian coast to the westward, bound for the Lofoden Islands. My father was in high spirit because of the excellent and gratifying returns he had received from our last catch by marketing at Stockholm, instead of selling at one of the seafaring towns along the Scandinavian coast. He was especially pleased with the sale of some ivory tusks that he had found on the west coast of Franz Joseph Land during one of his northern cruises the previous year, and he expressed the hope that this time we might again be fortunate enough to load our little fishing sloop with ivory instead of cod, herring, mackerel, and salmon. We put in at Hammerfest, latitude 71 degrees and 40 minutes for a few days rest. Here we remained one week laying in an extra supply of provisions and, and several casks of drinking water and then sailed toward Spitsbergen. For the first few days, we had an open sea and favoring wind, and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs. A vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not possibly have threaded its way among the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through the barely open channels. 
these monster bergs presented an endless succession of crystal palaces of massive cathedrals and fantastic mountain ranges grim and sentinel-like immovable as some towering cliff of solid rock standing silent as sphinx resisting the restless waves of a fretful sea after many narrow escapes we arrived at spitzbergen on the 23rd day of june and anchored at Wajad Bay for a short time, where we were quite successful in our catches. We then lifted anchor and sailed through the Hinlopen Strait and coasted along the northeast land. A strong wind came up from the southwest, and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Joseph Land, where the year before he had by accident found the ivory tusks that had brought him such a good price at Stockholm. Never before or since have I seen so many seafowl. They were so numerous that they hid the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For several days we sailed along the rocky coast of Franz Josef Land. Finally, a favoring wind came up that enabled us to make the west coast, and after sailing 24 hours we came to a beautiful inlet. One could hardly believe it was Northland. The place was green with growing vegetation, and while the area did not comprise more than one or two acres, yet the air was warm and tranquil. It seemed to be at that point where the Gulf Stream's influence is most keenly felt. On the east coast, there were numerous icebergs, yet here we were in open water. Far to the west of us, however, were ice packs, and still farther to the westward the ice appeared like ranges of low hills. In front of us and directly to the north lay an open sea. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me they were gods who had come from far beyond the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than any that mortal man had ever known, and that it was inhabited by the chosen. And I'm going to just interject here that there are many, many folkloric tales of there being some sort of special people, special gods, chosen people at the North Pole area. So this isn't something that was just in Norse mythology. This is something like so many of the other tales from around the world. This is something else that many other cultures have in common with the Norse in this belief. I'm going to continue on now. My youthful imagination was fired by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I exclaimed, why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind favorable, and the sea open. Even now I can see the expression of pleasurable surprise on his countenance as he turned toward me and asked, my son, are you willing to go with me and explore, to go far beyond where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively. Very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. And quickly adjusting the sails, he glanced at our compass, turned the prow in due northerly direction through an open channel, and our voyage had begun. The sun was low in the horizon, as it was still the early summer. Indeed, we had almost four months of day ahead of us, before the frozen night could come on again. Our little fishing sloop sprang forward as if eager as ourselves for adventure. Within 36 hours, we were out of sight of the highest point on the coastline of Franz Joseph Land. We seemed to be in a strong current running north by northeast. Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down on the narrows and passed through channels and out into open seas. Channels so narrow in places that had our craft been other than small, we could never have gotten through. On the third day, we came to an island. Its shores were washed by an open sea. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This new land was destitute of timber, but we found a large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of the trees were 40 feet long and two feet in diameter. After one day's exploration of the coastline of this island, we lifted anchor and turned our prow to the north in an open sea. I remember that neither my father nor myself had, had tasted food for almost 30 hours. Perhaps this was because of the tension of excitement about our strange voyage in waters farther north, my father said, than anyone had ever been. 
active mentality had dulled the demands of the physical needs. Instead of the cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been while in Hammerfest on the north coast of Norway some six weeks before. We both frankly admitted that we were very hungry, and forthwith I prepared a substantial meal from our well-stored larder. When we had partaken heartily of the repaste, I told my father I believed I would sleep, as I was beginning to feel quite drowsy. Very well, he replied, I will keep the watch. I have no way to determine how long I slept. I only know that I was rudely awakened by a terrible commotion of the sloop. To my surprise, I found my father sleeping soundly. I cried out lustily to him, and starting up, he sprang quickly to his feet. Indeed, had he not instantly clutched the rail, he would certainly have been thrown into the seething waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at a terrific speed, and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was writhing in convulsions. A few icebergs we knew were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girding the horizon from left to right, was a vaporish fog or mist, black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top, which was finally lost to view as it blended with the great white flakes of falling snow. Whether it covered a treacherous iceberg or some other hidden obstacle against which our little sloop would dash and send us to a watery grave, or was merely the phenomenon of an arctic fog, there was no way to determine. By what miracle we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned as if its joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlpool or maelstrom. Fortunately, our compass had been fastened with long screws to a crossbeam. Most of our provisions, however, were tumbled out and swept away from the deck of the cuddy, and had we not taken the precaution at the very beginning to tie ourselves firmly to the masts of the sloop, we should have been swept into the lashing sea. Above the deafening tumult of the raging waves, I heard my father's voice. Be courageous, my son, he shouted. Odin is the god of the waters, the companion of the brave, and he is with us. Fear not. To me it seemed there was no possibility of our escaping a horrible death. The little sloop was shipping water, the snow was falling so fast as to be blinding, and the waves were tumbling over our counters in reckless white-sprayed fury. There was no telling what instant we should be dashed against some drifting ice pack. The tremendous swells would heave us up to the very peaks of mountainous waves, then plunge us down into the depths of the sea's trough, as if our fishing sloop were a fragile shell. Gigantic white-capped waves, like veritable walls, fenced us in, fore and aft. This terrible nerve-wracking ordeal, with its nameless horrors of suspense and agony of fear indescribable, continued for more than three hours, and all the time we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then suddenly, as if growing weary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury and, by degrees, to die down. At last we were in perfect calm. The fog mist had also disappeared, and before us lay an iceless channel, perhaps ten or fifteen miles wide with a few icebergs far away to our right, and an intermittent, an intermittent archipelago of smaller ones to the left. I watched my father closely, determined to remain silent until he spoke. Presently he untied the rope from his waist, and without saying a word began working the pumps, which fortunately were not damaged relieving the sloop of the water it had shipped in the madness of the storm. He put up the sloop's sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net, and then remarked that we were ready for a favoring wind when it came. His courage and persistence were truly remarkable. Our investigation we found less than one-third of our provisions remaining, while to our utter dismay we discovered that our water casks had been swept overboard during the violent plungings of our boat. Two of our water casks were in the main hold. Both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness of our position. Presently, I was seized with a consuming thirst. 
It is indeed bad, remarked my father. However, let us dry our bedraggled clothing, for we are soaked to the skin. Trust to the god Odin, my son. Do not give up hope. The sun was beating down slantingly, as if we were in a southern latitude, instead of in the far northland. It was swinging around, its orbit ever visible and rising higher and higher each day, frequently mist-covered, yet always peering through the lacework of clouds like some fretful eye of fate, guarding the mysterious northland and jealously watching the pranks of man. Far to our right, the rays decking the prisms of icebergs were gorgeous. The reflections emitted flashes of garnet, of diamond, of sapphire, a pyrotechnic panorama of countless colors and shapes, while below could be seen the green-tinted tinted sea and above the purple sky. And that brings us to the end of today's reading. The next section that we will be reading, Lord willing, next week will be part three, Beyond the North Wind. So... I hope that you all enjoyed this. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.